Uh, so you've heard me talk about David Dada uh, a few times, I think. The, he was a, a cousin of the Buddhas. Um, he was also very ambitious, and he didn't learn much from his cousin, uh, so much so that he wanted to um, start his own Sangha and establish himself as a great spiritual teacher of his time. Uh, he was so confused and deluded about that that he uh, conspired with uh, King Bimansara's son to kill the Buddha, and the son would take over the king's throne, and, and uh, Devadatta would be great spiritual teacher. Uh, and actually, he tried twice, and he failed twice, obviously. The, uh, in this, th this sutta, uh, the Buddha uses Devadatta as an example of what can happen from a mind that is so rooted in greed, aversion, and deluded thinking, even when it's exposed to these incredible teachings, if it doesn't practice the Dhamma the way it's presented, you're only going to continue your own greed, aversion, and deluded thinking. And it's a it's both a very practical and direct teaching, but it's it's also an archetypal teaching of what has happened. Um, even right beginning, right when the Buddha passed away, there was um, people within the original Sangha that wanted to start adapting, accommodating, and embellishing the, Duke, the Buddha's Dhamma to fit um, what they thought it should be, or what fit their own deluded views. And um, that played out in the second and the third Buddhist councils, where eventually the Mahasangikas uh, made a complete split from the Buddha's original teachings and began their own um, visionary type of uh, Dharma that was more akin to um, what was presented in the Vedas and the Upanishads, the, the uh, precursor to modern Hinduism. Uh, and that was the precursor to uh, modern Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, in this case, it took Devadatta so, um, it took him to such a mindless state that he thought it was okay to kill his cousin to gain power. So Devadatta achieved a certain level of intuitive powers through preliminary development, but gained little initial wisdom, wisdom or discernment. He decided that he had a more comprehensive understanding than the Buddha. David Dada was driven by the need to be acknowledged as an enlightened being rather than actually develop the Dhamma. And that, that's, that's such a common, unfortunately, a common aspect of greed that overcomes many people. They're, 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 they're too consumed about being acknowledged as, as having some type of Buddhist knowledge that they skip actually developing the Dhamma and establish and even go so far as to establish um, lineages that have lasted for hundreds, even thousands of years based on that I know better attitude. David Dada wanted, wanted to introduce his own Dhamma and gain recognition with his peers, material wealth, and power. David Dada played, plotted to have the Buddha killed so that he could take over the Sangha. He succeeded in distracting 500 monks to follow him. The plot failed and most of those mon monks returned to the Buddha Sangha. The Buddha used this situation as an, an opportunity to teach mindfulness of the Dhamma and point out the dangers of dismissing the Eightfold Path and continuing greed, aversion, and deluded thinking, even when it, within a Dhamma practice. In other words, it's something you hear me say all the time, that the Buddha taught a very simple and direct Dhamma that anybody can develop. The difficulty is not trying to adapt, accommodate, or embellish the Dhamma to fit your own views, and those views are rooted in ignorance and Four Noble Truths. It'll always fail. It'll always prove to be a distraction. You're not likely going to find something that is as simple, powerful, and effective as an awakened human being's Dhamma. When you try to fit it to fit your own views, you're only continuing to ignore your own ignorance. Um, Devadatta, the Devadatta Sutta, Monk's Greed. On one occasion, the Buddha was staying near Rajagaha on Vulture Peak Mountain. His cousin Devadatta had just left the Sangha in disgrace after attempting to murder the Buddha to take control of the Buddha Sangha. The Buddha, referring to Devadatta, addressed those gathered. Friends, it is skillful to reflect on one's failings, 
and it is skillful to reflect on the failings of others. Likewise, it is skillful to reflect on one's attainments and also on the attainments of others. And you hear me say often that the Buddha, when you really understand the Buddha's teachings, it's, it is as important to recognize what is unskillful and should be abandoned as it is to recognize what to hold in mind. And, and what the Buddha told, taught was most important to hold in mind after the four foundations of mindfulness is the Eightfold Path. And he never really wavered from that initial instruction. It is skillful to reflect on one's attainments and also on the attainments of others. Distracted and overcome by eight untrue dhammas, his mind overcome, David Dada is headed for a state of endless ignorance and confusion. And in this case, using the word dhamma um, is not refer referring to a, a comprehensive spiritual practice or spiritual philosophy. In this sense, it's a very um, distinct fabricated condition of the mind. And that'll become clear in just a moment. David Dada is headed for a state of endless ignorance and confusion. Which eight? Distracted and overcome by clinging to material gain. That's the one Dhamma, the one untrue Dhamma. Distracted and overcome by clinging to lack of material gain. Distra distracted and overcome by status distracted and overcome by lack of status. It's an interesting thing that um, for the 45 years of the Buddha's teaching career, he never gave his Sangha a name or his Dhamma a name. He simply referred to it as the heartwood. It was never the flying white lotus standing on their head Sangha or any other, any, I'm, I'm being silly, but he, I mean, he could have called it the most wonderful path sangha or anything. But that would have been an aspect of grasping after status, wouldn't it? He always left, let the Dhamma be the Dhamma and not embellish, embellish it in any way, including in his own mind. And he never held himself out as anything special other than a human being who figured this out. He was the first one who figured it out. He never cared about status at all. And yet, Throughout his teaching career, he ha he was acknowledged by most of the leaders of that part of northern India as a great teacher. <clears throat> distracted and overcome by offerings of praise and goods, distracted and overcome by the lack of offerings of praise and goods. Remember that sutta a few weeks ago where um, a, a, there's a group in the, in the town that wants the Buddha to come and talk to them, but they're very loud and boisterous and they want to hold the Buddha up as something special. And he says, no, he, he told the representative, that's not for me. You can't look at me that way. That, that's a false Dhamma. Distracted and overcome by lack of offerings of praise and goods. Distracted and overcome by clinging to ambition. Distracted and overcome by unwholesome associations. And that was, in the, when you get, in, get into the story of David Dodd, it wasn't just uh, Bimbasara's son, I wish I could remember his name, but it was a, a small group of, I guess you could call them spiritual teachers, but they were so driven by their greed and aversion and deluded thinking, aversion to the Buddha's Dhamma and their, their desire to create something else, that it led all of them down this, this path that the Buddha said this, you, you can't recover from. Distracted and overcome by unwholesome associations, his mind perverted, David Dada is headed for a state of continued distraction, deprivation, and inescapable ignorance, confusion, and ongoing suffering. What an awful state. It's rooted in those three defilements. So, excuse me. David Dada is <clears throat> a perfect example, though an extreme example, of a mind overcome by the three defilements, isn't it? Isn't he? And it's not to say that everyone would end up wanting to kill the Buddha or kill a Buddhist teacher or something like that. But the result is going to be the same as long as you're clinging to, to greed, aversion, and deluded thinking, especially once you come into the Dhamma or come to the Dhamma. 
And that's really what the Buddha is talking about here. Here, Devadatta learned from, or could have learned from his cousin, the Buddha, directly, as everyone else around him had. Excuse me. But he could not overcome his own schemes to continue to ignore his own ignorance. He was so full of himself and his, and his associations that even with a Buddha teaching him, he, was still, he would still continue that. And again, it's, it's um, in some ways to me, there's nothing more tragic than a, 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 than a person like that, not just David Dada, but anyone who comes across these incredible teachings and yet can't get past those three defilements in order to develop those teachings. And again, it's something that is very common. Um, and I guess it's one of the reasons why I teach how I teach, because it, it is so, um, I don't want to say it's heartbreaking, but it's, it's, maybe it is, maybe that's the right word, to see people that are grasping for understanding, but it just can't get past that, that initial ignorance. Well, he has grown up in a palace as well. Pardon me? Did David Dada have grown up in a palace as well? No, it's a great question. Yeah, he, he would have because the the uh, that that whole family clan was was established as leader. So yeah, it's a good point. And so he had a he had an uh, an innate thirst to continue having he had a powerful an association with what it meant. Yeah. To have them. Yeah, he couldn't be just a just another Dhamma practitioner, could he? <clears throat> but that's the, that's this, the, the often subtle distraction that causes many who have come to the Dhamma to say it's just not enough. Because it isn't, if you're, if you're, if you're not recognizing the fact that you're looking for constant um, self-establishment, the Buddha's Dhamma takes all that away. It doesn't give you anything. It doesn't give anything for an ego to hold on to. And, and I'm, you know, I'm just talking about this from direct experience. Others things do. And you, there's, there's incredible hierarchies um, and uh, attainments. There's, there's a, uh, I don't, I don't want to get into, the, get into the weeds too much on this, but there's one particular local uh, but worldwide established lineage that makes money on selling attainments and what what's more self-serving than attainments you know and it's taught that if you know to get to the next level you got to spend this money and we'll give you this this attainment we'll give you the buddha never taught anything like that he taught everything um in a plain simple and direct way and he taught it to anyone that, that was interested meaning it that the uh the um, the caste system was still well entrenched during the Buddhist time, as it still is today, unfortunately. And you weren't supposed to give so-called teachings of any kind to people in lower classes, and certainly not to the, to, what, I don't remember what they called them then, but what we would call today the untouchables. That was a, you know, that was the worst thing you could do. But the Buddha never had a distinction. He just wanted to teach people how to awaken, how to gain understanding. And so this idea of using the Dhamma to seek status is so contradictory, isn't it? But if you're, but that, that manifests in so many subtle ways to a mind that is still rooted in self-referential views needing to con continually self-establish itself, whether it's with association with a lineage or a group or a temple or whatever it might be, a, a, a certain teacher. We do that through, we, we make those associations through grasping. Um, Saturday Sutta gets into this even a little bit deeper based on that question from, uh, from Ananda. It is for this compelling reason that one should keep abandoning again and again, any craving for or clinging to, and there's that list, material gain or lack of material gain, gaining status or not gaining status, gaining praise or not gaining praise. It is for this compelling reason that one should keep abandoning again and again any craving for or clinging to unwholesome, unwholesome ambition and any unwholesome association. You should train yourselves. I will keep abandoning again and again 
clinging to any material gain, clinging to any lack of material gain, clinging, any clinging to status or clinging to lack of status, clinging to offerings of praise and goods, and clinging or clinging to offerings, any clinging to ambition or any clinging to unwholesome friendship. That's how you should train yourself. That's the end of the sutra. Thank you. Again, very simple and direct, isn't it? And it speaks directly to overcoming the three defilements. Be mindful of it. And he's using such a perfect example of one of their own who had lost his mind so to such an extent that he wanted to kill his teacher. Um, this, uh, I'm... I don't want to start giving Saturday's class already, but this, this theme of maintaining mindfulness of this simple and direct Dhamma, it's something that comes up again and again. That's why you hear me teaching suttas on it again and again. Because even during the Buddha's time, even when it, within his own Sangha, there was this need for continual self-identification with things outside of the Dhamma or to make the Dhamma your own. And it may be a, a, a question for the group and we can talk about it if you want. I think the biggest difficulty that probably every one of us has had at one point or another within the Dhamma is not wanting it to be more. Is that an accurate statement? No, yes. Mm -hmm. well, you, for me, it's been not understanding that it wasn't what I thought it was. Mm. And yeah. again, it comes into like this this was my mindset coming here, and they, they took years of just chipping away at it to, to finally get to <clears throat> sustain this moment because it was all clouded by these, these other theories and and, 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 and dominance. Yeah. Yeah, that is, and that was really the same for me too. It, it took there was a period of undoing, I guess, when I finally settled on just what the Buddha taught. And you know, there was still I would recognize at times grasping at certain concepts that I had attached myself <laughs> to over over time, and I had to you know literally recognize them as something that was distracting me, realizing it wasn't part of the Buddha's dhamma. And, simply let it go. Mm -hmm. And it was a couple of years that I still continued um, going here to this temple or that monastery or that local sangha just out of association because people that I knew were going there. And, you know, it, was, it felt good. But it was always also always very frustrating to hear what, what was being taught and what I was expected to accept as Buddhism when I knew it wasn't. So I, I had to make that, make, make, make that split, uh, make that separation. Uh, and then the Dhamma started deepening for me too. But the, the point of all this is, is, is just to maintain the Eightfold Path as a framework for our Dhamma practice and not try to embellish it in any way. And the remarkable thing is that we do that here. You know, this is this is why we've all developed the Dhamma to the extent that we have, because we've we've been such a well focused uh, sangha and didn't fall into these other things. So, um, uh, Dan is online, and I think that's uh, I think it says Eileen, but I think that's Jane. If you uh, if you have any questions, now's the time. There hey, you Dan. How are you, Dan? I'm still here. I'm good. How you been? I've I've been well. It's nice to see you. How's Melissa? She's good. She's on a business trip, so it's just me tonight. But uh, no, it's said, really hello. cool. We all said hello. Dan, yeah. always, some of you always remember Dan from our last retreat. Yep. Um, you have any questions or comments on tonight's uh, tonight's? Um, no, it was really a, a great studio. I think uh, my meditation has been great. I, I love meditating, and uh, I listen to your talks um, at work when I can, and I'm really immersed in, in all the teachings and. Um, you know, as far as meditation and the Dhamma being more than anything, I think right now I'm still kind of basking in the warmth of the simplicity of it all. Um, and I, I'm not bored with it. Or I guess I, I, I'm not bored with it at all, um, if anything. So, um, 
so it's been yeah i've been uh i've been i've been good with it so i appreciate everything you've, you've done so thank you thank you dan uh yeah with, with a, a well-focused dhamma practice there's no reason to be bored you know boredom arises from the need for for immediate sensory stimulation right now i just can't stand not having some and so with, with a with a well-focused dhamma practice you can avoid that uh, just a quick question how's the truth of happiness course going good good i uh i'm gonna submit tonight my my second one so uh okay. i'm ready for that it's been good so i'm uh i'm actually like reading all three of your books right now all at the same time right <laughs> Well, if it works, that's great. <laughs> well, same time too, so <laughs> it's good to see you, Dan. Thanks. And, Thanks for having me. And and yeah, you know, you don't have to. We're gonna go around a room. If you have anything else to say, just uh, wave. And and Jane, okay. if you, you want to say anything, please turn your mic on. If not, I'm just I'm glad you're joining us. Lorna, good to see you tonight. Good morning. Good evening. That's the second good morning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, um, I, I think that was a little bit uh, surprising in your introduction when you said it's really about the saga and the focus of the saga, etc. Because that the main message that I get out of the sutta is just how crazy, stupid, the deluded minds can take you, yeah. and how crazy, stupid ideas we get to fulfil our own ego. Um, and that was really the main sort of message I got from the sutta. Um, obviously, it did take you to an extreme when you start killing people or trying to kill people. Yes, it starts an extreme. But, you know, the, I'm sure that you catch your, your own thoughts, um, you know, when you try to be mindful of your own thoughts, you do catch yourself going down my ego path and uh, maybe saying things to other people that are a bit um, stronger, trying to reinforce your own ego and things like that. And uh, sometimes you feel a late, you know, a, a departure moment afterwards. And then uh, you realize, you realize that you're, the victim of your own ego, and unfortunately, somebody else has to put up with it. You know, you have somebody else has to, is yeah. at the other end of your ego. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, that can, you know, be destructive or uh, destroy your friendship or your acquaintance, you know, acquaintance that you meet or something. You yeah. know, you can, you can really put people off. Um, so, you know, getting back to the, the big question, be, be, be mindful, mindful of your own mind, be mindful of your own feelings and, and your own thoughts. Uh, the Eightfold Path is there for you to reflect upon your own thoughts and your own um, feelings. It's not there to be looked at, looked for in the outside world. That's a lot. Thank you. Yeah, that, that is what the Eightfold Path is for. It's just a framework and a guidance for understanding how we think and change it to, to, from, to go from wrong thinking to right thinking. I didn't develop the idea of the, or the connection to the Sangha very well, but the the David Nada took 500 people from the original Sangha away from that Sangha. And so you, that the point is the influence that one person can have through those associations and distract a whole group of people away from an awakened human being who was there teaching at the time. It's just remarkable. And so all of those all of those people followed David Dada because of the same misguided understanding of themselves in relation to greed, aversion, and ongoing deluded thinking. They didn't see it because they were stuck in their own their own views that were ignorant of for noble truths. And so those things that, that allow us to continue to ignore ignorance seem like the most 
reasonable thing to do, like follow David Dada. That's how it happens. Good to see you, Ron. It is amazing, really, how focused this saga is. It is. I, I keep saying it. Do you believe me, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> all the other sanghas I have seen and I've been in, there's always this posturing and maneuvering and things going on for status within the sangha. Okay. And it's not happening here. So it's, it's, it's like status in one life, what way? Like the same. Oh, you know, there's always the, 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 the wanting to be one of the senior disciples and you know, have more uh, access to the teacher. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I remember having a conversation with one of the people that uh, uh, was part of, the, of my previous sangha in the Rosho. And uh, when I described what I was doing here, his first reaction was, uh, so you're going to be pretty, uh, you're going to be like chief disciple pretty soon. And I just kind of looked at him and was like, what, why would I want to do that? You know, and, and what the hell does that mean in the first place? Yeah. Um, but, but it was like his, his natural reaction. And that's what was going on in, in that side of it. That there were, you know, there's the upper crust, and then there's the the the, the fellows and and, and 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 the people just, you know, doing the work. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. I, that's why I say it all the time. Another way that mm -hmm. status can come up, um, and I've been a part of these types of unfocused sanghas. There was a, you know, there's a, especially early on, six years ago, there were people that wanted me to do. Uh, like this week, uh, I want to share a great poem that I've heard. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a nice thing, but it has nothing to do with the Dhamma. Mm -hmm. And this is so it's an inappropriate place. Or um, you, let's listen to a tape by somebody I just heard on the radio, a, a Buddhist psychiatrist picked one. Okay, but that's not what the Buddha taught. And that's fine, mm -hmm. you know, but it's, th that's, that's, that's also status seeking. I discovered something. I heard something today that's so wonderful. Let's all listen to it. Okay, but why don't we just study what the Buddha taught? Um, a lot of times that idea devolves into individuals giving so-called, well, I'll call them Dharma talks based on concepts like, I'm going to give a talk on spiritual friendship, which is really what the Upada Sutta is, but making no reference or connection to what the Buddha actually taught. So that's another aspect of seeking status. I'm setting myself up. It's kind of like, um, almost like show and tell for adults in a Buddhist community. It really becomes a serious responsibility for the Sangha to represent the Buddhist teachings and your teachings. And you can see how very quickly the Sangha started fracturing yeah. As soon as we passed immediately, you know, and Ananda, who is David Dada's brother, yeah. is the model of mindfulness. Very few people represent mindfulness aspects of mindfulness better than Ananda, yeah. and it's almost selflessness and not wanting status. And I, I, I like that. Uh, these brothers who just took totally different path. Yeah. It, and you mentioned that responsibility. I, it's Ananda that asked a question in the Upada Sutta that leads to the Sutta. So you're, you're, you're giving part of the talk next week. They're, they're, the underlying aspect of that is the responsibility that I have if I'm going to share the Dhamma in any way to keep it to the Dhamma. And how can I do that unless I first learn what it is? Rather than what they were using David Dada as an example, he didn't learn what it is. He learned what he thought was enough to then go off on his own and, and gain status and recognition and power and wealth and all the other things. Instead of 
as the Buddha said, to use such a perfect example of recognizing that if you're chasing after material gain or you're confused about losing material gain, you're lost. Your mind is lost. But if you develop the Eightfold Path, in fact, the Upada Sutta does touch on the Buddha talking about what to do when you make a lot of money. Basically, don't lose your head over it. He didn't say it's bad to do it, but don't get distracted by it. Don't lose your mind over it. David, good to see you tonight. I'm, I'm sorry, Ron. Did, did you? I kind of interrupted you. No, no, that's okay. What I <laughs> Hi, David. I, I really enjoyed this too. It's, again, it's just little slices of these teachings of mindfulness and how very quickly they went about in killing his teachings. Yeah. And perverting what a simple teaching was. And when he was alive, he, he knew this was going to happen. Yeah. So, again, it's one of those uh, clever little teachings that I, I appreciate. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I do too. I appreciate it. Helen, good to see you. Good morning. Thank you. Good to be here. Um, do we know what he offered the monks that he asked the five hundred? Do we know what he said to them that dissuaded them from staying where they were? Yeah, them? A, a true dhamma. Hmm. They may have oh, just more seen status. for themselves. Oh yeah, and more status. Yeah, I mean, he, see, he was he was a, a man rooted in his own ego, so he used that. He went to, and that's another, you, you bring up something else, I don't mean to interrupt you, that one of the, I don't even know how to explain this. It seems like people that have a very large ego in the sense that I know what it should be, have the most difficulty with developing something mm -hmm. because it gets right to, you, you, you really can't go too far if you're insisting on maintaining a strong self-referential ego personality, can you? In this, in this, in the Buddha's Dhamma, because it gets right to the heart of it. Mm -hmm. I interrupted you, I'm sorry. No, I just, you know, I, I'm always curious about the backstory of things and, and setting and, you know, what, what was the tipping point for those 500 monks that they would leave the city and clarity of what the Buddha was teaching, given that they had been taught the Four Noble Truths and what is the name of the Eightfold Path. So it's, I guess it's just the, you know, the weakness of being human, right? Yeah. Rather than something that's kind of embedded. Well, and yeah. It's the, not, and it's not an easy path. No. It's, it's continual testing yourself yes. against reality. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the sheer austerity of the path itself. Mm -hmm. um, we've all had, I don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to denigrate anyone, but I want to use an example. Within our Sangha, we've had people that have come here that have been very, very excited. We've all seen that about what they heard here. Um, but then they get, they seem to get distracted by the, by the austerity of what's presented here. You know, it's just this, it's not that. There's, and there's not a lot, if you really don't want to develop the Dhamma, this is not a Dhamma to develop. You know, you don't understand what I'm saying? There's no distraction and it's, it's meant to be that way. In fact, that's probably one of the, the, the the um, the things that I find that one of the things that I realized if I was going to teach the Buddha's Dhamma, I had to teach it in a way that was distraction free, and that that was I wouldn't say it was difficult, but it was a bit of a struggle between trying to keep people just happy with what they what they heard here by just coming across over meditation center, and maybe to keep coming, but also understanding that the Dhamma is not, 
you can't use a carrot and a stick with a dhamma. It's just what it is. And, you know, so I realized very early on, I think like some of the other ones, I mean, in, in the Buddhist Sangha, that you have to be authentic to it no matter what, or you're just leading to people. And this is, this is the point of this sutta, by the way, in, in the Upada Sutta. If you're not, then you're just leading to people's suffering because you're continuing their own ignorance. You might be for, for providing something that is very entertaining and distracting and they feel good and the, the, there's a lot of people doing it, but you're just contributing to people's ignorance. And to me, I think that's the, that's one of the most egregious things anybody can do, at least to me, and that's why I don't do it. So. And it is remarkable. Again, I say this all the time, and Matt and I, we say it at least once every time we get together, because the sangha is, is remarkable in their focus, because this is something, as the Buddha taught in the Anapanasati Sutta, holding out those monks as an example of a well-practiced Dhamma, um, that it's something rare in the world, and it is. And it's not that we're better and they're worse, or we're right and they're wrong. It's just that we practice the Dhamma, and other people find it not to their liking. And that's what this is about. I think the more important question is why did those 500 return? If they saw that what was being offered didn't bring lasting satisfaction, and they realized that they didn't have right view, so they returned. Yeah, I think, well, maybe so there's, there is a bit more to the story. Maybe I, I should tell that quickly, but I won't do it tonight. But they, they realized very quickly, once David Dada did what he did, that this is not someone to follow. And so let's go back to, to, the, to that guy that, you know, to that he made sense, you know, the Buddha made sense. But again, it's, it's a very austere practice. Mm -hmm. Then why does it chaos and confusion and complexity of day-to-day -day life is certainly at the best of the storm? Yeah. Thank you. you know, it, it is. I mean, and it's that's what it's supposed to be, isn't it? But I mean, and it shouldn't any, excuse me, any spiritual practice be just that? And maybe they are, but I never, I didn't find that until I, I didn't find true refuge until I actually found the Buddha's Dhamma, even though I had taken vows of refuge before that. I'm just realizing that the 500 monks that returned is exactly who the Buddha is addressing. In this oh, in this? Yeah. yeah. And the ones that remained. And the ones, yeah. But yeah. that's weird. That, take a look at what you've done. And it's not like whacking them over the head, but it's just, this is what happened. Learn from it. Yeah, in a, in a simple and, and as direct way as possible. And again, within the framework of his, his Dhamma, you know, and he, he didn't, uh, he didn't even embellish, which somebody who was still stuck in an ego would, in, would embellish the foolishness of David. No, that's not the right word. He didn't take advantage of the situation by saying, you know, I'm so wonderful. Look what a fool he is. He just said, this is what he did wrong. Don't do it. Simple and direct. Andrew, good to see you tonight. Thank you. Subsequent to uh, David Dada's um, distraction and, and being uh, led by his own statusism, there are many, many people who have gone off to perform various labors of Buddha yep. after that. Can you pertain that every one of them was led astray by the same kind of Buddhist thinking, or have there been some? Notable, listenable versions that evolved. Okay. Off with all their heads. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I mean, it, honestly, Andrew, there, it, there's there's not many modern Buddhist teachers that I have found, and I've studied with many of them and read a lot of them that teach just what the Buddha taught and don't adapt it or accommodate or embellish it mm -hmm. in small ways, but small, but large enough to make it distracting and misleading to, to just 
completely something completely different that has no resemblance at all to what the Buddha taught. Mm -hmm. And yet they they have an, a, that they're not right or wrong. They're not good or bad. It's just the way it is. And so you you cannot teach something that you don't know. And you can't know something unless you actually study it and develop it. And so if your roots aren't in that, you can't do it. It doesn't, it, the, the Buddha taught a very specific path. And, it, and when it's adapted, accommodated, or embellished in any way, the entire path is lost. And that's not to say that there's not some incredibly wonderful people within what is called modern Buddhism. There's, there's hundreds and thousands of them that are well-intentioned. But for the most part, they're misguided because they have adapted, the, what, adapted or dismissed what the Buddha actually taught. And that's rooted in a lot of lineages. So you know, some of it just goes back to, well, this is what my teacher taught. And his lineage goes back here, you know, maybe to, to, a, to Dogen or something, say. Um, okay, but Dogen didn't teach what the Buddha taught, or Nagarjuna, or when it, some of the, the Tibetan schools chased, traced their lineages back to ultimately to, uh, to gods and goddesses, not, and then from, then from the god and goddess, that goes back to the Buddha. So that's the connection, but there's no real connection. So to answer your question, there's, there's not much of it. I, I've come across very little. Mm -hmm. And I hear it all the time online from people that, you know, they're, um, like I say, I'm, I, I, I don't, I've been studying Buddhism for, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this. I've been a, stu a student of Buddhism for 20, 30 years, and nobody's ever mentioned Four Noble Truths or the Eightfold Path. Or they teach it in a way that it's it's an anachronism. You don't don't have to bother with this. So um, when you read the suttas out of the Sutta Pitaka, which when you read them, the incredible consistency is what what is most remarkable. I mean, the consistency of the of what the Buddha is teaching. It's very clear this is what he taught, and it's also very clear that he spent a lot of time saying, "Don't go there. Don't do what David did." So it's, a, it's an important question. Thank you. So, and, and, and Drew, who was here a couple of weeks ago, and I, I already acknowledged that I think I, I misread what he was saying, but he was, he, the question was, was the Buddha the only enlightened pe person? And I didn't answer that directly. I misunderstood what he was saying. But in terms of what we might call enlightenment, there were many people that we would call enlightenment, Aristotle, Socrates, maybe modern people like Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, Gandhi. But the Buddha was the only one who taught an eightfold path. That's what separates him from every other path. And his understanding of what awakening meant is different than any other philosopher. Completely different. Isn't it's that, a profound understanding of suffering. Isn't that understanding the, the, almost the core of so-called enlightenment? Well, but even that understanding has different has different meanings depending on who you are, or maybe you know, are are the prophets? Was, was Abraham enlightened? Most most religious scholars would say yes. He fits that category, but that's a completely different type of enlightenment, isn't it? And Christianity itself is a completely different philosophical religion than an eightfold path. So that's that's a deciding distinction, and that's and that's <clears throat> again, it's just what it is. It's not. If somebody said, do you, what, what do you think? If somebody asked me the direct question, what is the best path for all humanity? I'm going to say the best path is the Eightfold Path. But if you tell me, well, I'm practicing the Ten Commandments, I'm going to say that's wonderful. You know? I don't know, you know? But if you, if you came in this room and said, I think the Ten Commandments are superior to the Eightfold Path, in this room, I'll give you an argument. And I would tell you why I think that. Because... <laughs> so go, why? Because there's too much eye making in that. But <laughs> thank you, Andrew. Were you, did, were you finished? Yeah. That's that was great. Thanks for that question. Kevin, good to see you. Good to see you, Tom. Nice to be here with Sandra again. Place is rare in the world. <laughs> you know, I just think the context from a couple of weeks ago when you were talking about
thank you. That that the Arya Sanasutta was, and all of these are kind of in the same theme, isn't it? To, to be, to know what to focus on, know what to develop, and to know why. You know, again, I'm not I'm not so concerned about my position in heaven as I used to be, four or fifty years ago. What I am concerned about is the quality of my mind right here, right now. Because that's all I can be concerned about, isn't it? And because of that, I know how to, I know how to nurture my own mind through this Eightfold Path. A simple and direct meditation practice that I engage with for the sole purpose of deepening concentration so that I can hold in mind, so I'm well concentrated enough to hold in mind an Eightfold Path to guide my life, moment by moment. And that's the only thing that has brought the freedom and security that I was looking for since I was aware of anything, aware of myself. It's the only thing that made sense to me. So that's why I teach what I teach, but I wouldn't even teach that. I wouldn't even teach the way I teach, not because of my experience, because I follow how the Buddha teaches. That's the only way that I know to keep my, my own eye making out of it. And even then, well, maybe I'm getting, really getting a little bit off base, but one of the things that I, well, I don't question, I don't, it's not questioning myself. One of the things that I'm mindful of, not so much now as I was maybe four or five years ago, is am I teaching an authentic Dhamma or am I doing something that's going to be misleading or distracting to people by what I'm saying? And I think that those of you that are going to engage in the teacher training that we're going to start next year, that's really the point that I want to make. I think that's the most important thing. If you're going to teach it, you have to know it and you have to be authentic to it. If you don't want to do that, that's fine. You know, if I didn't want to do it, I can I'll go down to to uh, paradise golf and get my friend to let me teach some golf lessons. I can't do that anymore. I find something else to do, but if you're going to teach the Dhamma, you should be authentic to it. Russ, good to see you tonight. Wow. Yeah, I was just thinking, uh, in, a, in a way, it seems dark to do this because I mean, here was people who had the actual Buddha teaching. Not that you're not good, John. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think about that too. <laughs> yeah, and then you know, something else comes up that sounds great, then I'll do that. Yeah. So it sounds very simple in one way. One way. That's the most recent thing that the hard, kind of hard thing to do. Yeah. So that was what struck me. Yeah, and and if the 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 paradox there is that we want meaning in, in general, we want to be distracted. We want to be entertained. And there's nothing distracting or terribly entertaining about this, you know. But it can't be. I mean, every now and then I come up with a good joke, but. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I was thinking about when I first started teaching down in Andrew's, oh, in Andrew's building then, you know, it wasn't Andrew's then. I used to have these little props that I'd use and to make a point, but you, were you going there then? I don't even want to tell you what the props were. But, um, but it was the best I could do at the time, but I realized quickly that I was really doing, I was using the props to distract people to me. And you know, after a couple of weeks of that, I realized I don't want to do that. If I'm going to distract people to anything, it's going to be to distract people to the Dhamma. It's the only thing, only way I know to keep myself out of it as best as I can. I hope I do a good job. Liz, good to see you tonight. Good to see you, good to be here. You know, John, I think through your teaching, you create a, a level playing field that we're all sort of working to, to attain the same uh, information, wisdom, practice. So it's not um, like some of the other centers where there's, there's a, almost a throne that the teacher would sit on with a sentry 
sitting next to him. And, um, That's going to be in a new place, though. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to upgrade. Bodie's going to be my guard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Liz. <laughs> you're seeing in this well-centered song is a reflection of, of yourself and, and not to eye make it, but it, it's a reflection of how you um, created the environment here uh, for us to learn um, the very uh, simple but not easy process. Um, so, and that's something that's um, obviously important to you and a lot of people here haven't experienced those other um, circumstances. Um, but um, it, it seemed to me there was always, and I, I knew people that were in different sanghas, and it was a sort of um, hierarchy that kind of built up within the group. Mm -hmm. And then um, you know, things could completely fall apart, you know, and people would stop going, and, you know, um, and it got just away from where the lessons were supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So, I think that we are a reflection of you in a way, and um, it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's the same thing that you know, we meditate, we practice to put out the truth and the eightfold path. And, mm -hmm. um, to me, sometimes the suttas can be a little distracting. I try to, you know, look for some sort of new concept within the sutta, but it's really always that way. Same thing, which is a kind of a compliment. It is. Thank you. And I think that's that's how the, how the how the original sangha was. They they showed uh, the Buddha much more respect than you show me. <laughs> it, it, it was more of a ritualistic thing, but he was always he never presented himself as beyond anybody else. He he only he, he was just the guy that figured it out and decided to teach it. That's all. In fact, he he often. I, he, he referred to Sariputta as someone who had a, a better grasp of, and not in these exact words, but a better grasp of the Dhamma than he did in certain ways. So, thank you, Liz. Bonnie, good to see you. Good to see you too. Um, I think what's hard about the practice and the studying of, of the Eightfold Path is that if you really are seeing it and using it as, as a platform or a framework, it's about self-reflection. And I think it's hard sometimes to think that if you don't like what we do. Yeah. And it's easy to say that it's something outside of it. It's something, you know, to see it as not, to not own it. Yeah. And so, um, I think for me, when I get distracted and I feel like, oh, no, it's not working, or I, I'm, with this, I know I have this thing to, a bit of Sam to get out of my eye, so to speak, that, that it, it means that there's some personal work to do. So, yeah. Like I've been saying, it's the simplicity, there's this beautiful, simple, so logical and cognitive thing that helps us change uh, if we're able to see it yeah. and then follow down the path but that's the heart so the simple part of this is this simple uh, framework and the hard part is staying with it especially when when the clinging or the craving or the grasping really is the 
is arising. That's what's arising in wanting, you know, like for me to have it to not be so, for the for now to not be the way it is. So that's that's the hard part. I also feel like this practice allows me to practice and continue to grow and to continue to really. It, it, for me, it's always been like it's it's more than enough. It's there's it's been um, such a clarifying um, response to me not having the right words to describe what it is. No, you're not. It, it, thank you. They, the uh, <clears throat> this sutta and <clears throat> the one on <clears throat> Saturday and also the Arya Sama Sutta teach that the Dhamma is to be, the, the hardwood of the Dhamma is the Eightfold Path. And then there's some other suttas. We, we had this argument about superior or inferior suttas, such as the, uh, the Satipatthana Sutta, et cetera, um, that teach us how to develop the Dhamma. And so as Dhamma practitioners, the challenge is to, is to, is to keep, keep it to that framework and not need to change it any other anyway. And also what you were just alluding to, Bonnie, if, and, and maybe I'll, I'm, I'm gonna paraphrase it a little bit, is in our situationally, because of conditioned mind, we make exceptions at times to actually the, integrating the Dhamma. And then we're we- bargaining with ourselves. Yeah, like, and you know, like, not to get into the psychological aspects of that, but it's almost like a risk and reward thing that we play, I'm doing good enough, where we get to the point in the Dhamma that it's not a six-fold path or a seven-fold path or a nine-fold path. It's an eight-fold path. And, and that itself becomes, can become a difficulty. But I love what you said. It's always been more than enough. And it is. When we, when we actually integrate the eight-fold path, there's, there really is no reason to be doing anything else as far as our own self-development or awakening. What's more important? What's more important? Uh, thank you all for being such a well-focused Sangha. Um, it's been a great six years here. Um, we're gonna start in a new place that uh, it's just as wonderful. Um, and it's really, a, as Lorna said, it's just a place. So uh, I'm looking forward to, to moving down the street. Saturday will be our last class. If you can join us for that, we're gonna have a little bit of celebration, just some uh, cookies and tea or something. Um, and then if you can hang out to help us carry some of this stuff out, that'd be great. I understand if you can't, but you can use some help. Uh, and then our next, uh, our first class in a new place is a week from Tuesday. Down at, everybody knows where it is, right? Mm -hmm. Is this so there won't be one next Tuesday? No, what did I say? A week from tonight, oh, okay. next Tuesday. Okay. <laughs> And we can park in the lot. Yeah, park in the lot. Parking's only five dollars a car. <laughs> no, I mean, I, there's to me, there's some positives about, it, and that's one of them. We can park. We should be able to fit everybody in there. Um, if not, you know, close enough. It's only a block and a half from town. No stairs, so I like that. I just about made it up tonight. So that'll be good. It's a it's a really nice place. So. All right, any, any questions or comments before we finish, as we always do? We'll finish with meta. So again, find your relaxed meditation posture. Oh, let me acknowledge. Oh, it's Mary. Hey, Mary. Hi, Mary. Hi, Mary. She doesn't have the... the uh, and Jane, Daniel has left us in. I'm glad you joined us. Mary, do you want to say hello? Looks like you tried to turn your... Hello. Hey, Mary. Hey, Mary. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. When did you, I didn't, I didn't know, to, how long have you been on online? Yeah, I lost her again. All right, we're going to end our class tonight.
Again, find your relaxed meditation posture. Gently close your eyes, close your mouth. And again, take a moment to become mindful of your in-breath and your out-breath. And these are the Buddha's words on metta from the Karaniya Metta Sutta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short, or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires is not born again into this world. Thank you all for a wonderful class tonight. Thank you for joining online, Jane, Mary, and Daniel. Can you hear me, John? Yes. Oh, okay. Great class. <laughs> ah, thank you. Did, you. did you hear it all? Oh, yes. Oh, good, good, good. The, and tonight, you know, you heard the, see you, Kevin. You, you heard the announcement tonight's our last Tuesday night here. Next Tuesday, we'll be in, uh, down the street. Yes, I did. But that's okay, because I'm always here in my living room, so. <laughs> all right. All right. I'll see, you. I'll, I'll see you all again very quickly. Okay. Thanks for joining. Good night. Good night.